Today on Detroit Muscle, we're going to start a brand new project with an old school hot rod flavor. This is like having the keys to a secret candy store. It's the home of Alexander Automotive Classic Cars in Franklin, Tennessee. And they've got everything from Tri-5 Chevys to monumental Mopars. Some of the beauties in here are for sale, some aren't. Nevertheless, I'm not here to buy anything. I just want to show you a restored version of our next project vehicle on Detroit Muscle. You might be surprised. <laughs> Out of all the showstoppers in here, this is it. It's a post-war pre-muscle car era Ford that really changed the entire course of American car design. The big war was over and by the late 1940s, Americans were diving into a new era of prosperity. There were new designs everywhere, some a little daring for the time. However, due to war production, car designs had changed very little since the early 1940s. Then Ford Motor Company made a bold move by hiring an outside stylist named George Walker. The result in 1949 was a new breed of car with a sleek, radical look unlike any other. While most cars still had bulging fenders, this one had long, unbroken lines from the front bumper to the rear. It had famous styling cues like that bullet nose grille with heavy chrome molding and horizontal tail lights. Inside, there was more room and a new airplane-inspired dashboard. Ford touted its new ladder frame supporting a coil suspension up front and semi-elliptical springs out back. Power? Well, it still came from an L-head straight six or the time-honored 100-horse flathead V8. There was a two-door sport coupe, two- and four-door sedans, a drop top, and even a woody wagon. Over the years, the clean lines of the 49 Ford inspired customizers and triggered a new ongoing trend of sheet metal manipulation. It put Ford on the road to post-war prosperity. Well, here's what's in our future some 65 plus years later. It's a two-door 49 sedan that we picked up for a heck of a deal. And it runs and stops most of the time. Here's what happened. The previous owner prepped it, got it in primer, and then decided to dump his plans for restoration. So he decided to let it go. We jumped on board to offer this iconic old Ford a makeover. Now this thing isn't going to be like our normal build. We're going to get a little bit creative and build us a custom ride. Now this thing is also going to get some performance goodies thrown on top of it, as well as some of the basic stuff that needs to be addressed, well, we're going to have to take care of those. So you guys just sit back and enjoy the ride. It's going to be one fun car. The car has the original 100 horse flathead V8, which we could rebuild. There are some classic mods that we're planning to do that involve things like a bumper treatment, suicide doors, an Oldsmobile headlight swap, French antenna, and shaving this thing like a poodle. Meaning we're losing the door handles, emblems, and a bunch of trim. We'll have to take care of the paint as well with some kind of classic hot rod finish that we spray on. You old hot riders might remember the feel we're going for. So grease up your pompadour and grab your best gal, cause Project Banana Split is officially underway. Headed to a drive-in near you really soon. Our first modification is a pretty serious undertaking. We're gonna be doing a suicide door conversion. Now people have been doing this modification for years on all type of vehicles for one reason and one reason only. It's just plain cool. Now for a little background, they used to call them coach doors in the early days. They pretty much disappeared from production cars after World War II. Now they got that suicide door nickname for obvious reasons. In the 50s, custom car guys latched onto the idea and it's still popular now, as well as the name. First thing we're gonna do is get these old nasty seats out of the way. So it'll be easier to get in there and do some work. Before we can get down to swapping out hinges and such, we gotta get rid of this glass, this cover, some trim pieces and stuff like that. Most of these panels are pretty easy to remove. You just unscrew a few fasteners and you're in business. Pins hold on the door handle and window crank. Just drive out those with a punch.
Then a couple of wire clips need to come off so you can separate the regulator and window to remove them. Next, we're mounting a set of universal hinges for suicide door conversion. Well, all right, guys, we're about elbow deep into suiciding the doors on our old Ford. But before I get too carried away of putting the hinges on here in the back, I'm going to go ahead and spray the front bolts down with some WD-40 Specialist Rust Release Penetrant. That way it can be busy doing its thing while I'm busy back here in the back doing mine. We went to Summit Racing to get us a set of universal suicide hinges. Now these things don't fit anything particular, so expect to do a little bit of modifying to make them fit your exact application. There are a couple things that you want to keep in mind whenever you're mounting a hinge. One of the main things is the pivot point. You want to locate it as far out as possible and more or less as far back, kind of taking this leading edge of the box here and mounting it right on the edge of the door jamb. Now, whenever you order these things, well, they come individually or welded together like this one. We went ahead and done that. That way it saved me the hassle of having to line them up. There's no need to keep this old latch around. We won't be using it on the front side of the door or the spider webs either. All right, now we're going to set this thing into place. Kind of figure out exactly where we want it, keeping those inside the corner. With our marks in place, it's time to start breaking some eggs for this tasty omelet. I'll use our body saw to cut out the sections of the door jam where the new hinges are going to go. Well, all right guys, we got our holes cut. And now we have to do a little bit more trimming here of the inner structure of the door post. It's no big deal, but what we're trying to do is make room for this bar. Then we'll slide the door hinges in and tack them into place. And once we get the door opening and closing, we'll come back and brace all this stuff up. Guys, I gotta level with you. This is the first suicide door conversion I've been involved with, but it stands to reason these hinges have to be at a certain angle to work right, right? Yeah, that's 100% correct. Depending on that, well, it affects the way that door operates, swings open and closes. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's say you mount this upper hinge leaning outward. What that's gonna cause is the door to swing downhill. Well, if you lean it back, it's gonna cause the door to swing uphill. Most of the time, people want these completely plumb or straight up and down because that makes the door open nice and level. Now, any of these are viable options. It all depends on what you're trying to do. The primer has to be ground off the hinges so they can be tacked in. Then we'll tack the bottom hinge just a little bit, but we still wanna be able to move the top for replacement. Now we're only leveling up one axis of our door hinges and there's a reason why. It's because this door is so thick, we had to lay this upper hinge back just a bit. When I put this thing up there, you can see we're probably about three quarters of an inch or so in. No big deal, it's like I mentioned earlier, sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do to get what you gotta get. It's at this point in the process that we find out that we'll have to modify the hinges. You see, they sit around two and a half inches inside the quarter panel. If we use them as they are, well, we'll have to eliminate the window track and the windows in the doors. And we don't want to do that. So to work around the window issue, we're going to have to lengthen the hinges and move them back a little bit. And it looks like you're in fabrication mode. Yeah, I'm excited. Are you? Not really. So what we're gonna do is cut this right down through here and actually lengthen this a bit to extend that hinge. No real big deal, just gonna be a little more fab work. So I set up this little jig here to maintain that right angle of 90 degrees on our hinges. The bandsaw makes short work of cutting these hinges apart so they can be lengthened. We'll be reusing the tubes that the hinges actuate on as well, so we'll cut those off and sable. They also need to be cleaned up in preparation for welding. As does the end of the hinge where we'll lengthen them. 
but we're one step closer, we're almost ready to burn some wire. I'm gonna put my pieces in this cool little jig I got set up. Now originally, this thing was about two inches. We're gonna extend it to almost three and a half. I need to clamp these pieces in place to keep them from moving around. We can turn on the welder. The next thing we need to do is weld up this little piece of tubing. But before I do any welding on it, I've got to knock out this aluminum bushing out of the middle of it. Because once I start welding on it, I could distort it. I don't want to do that. A punch and some light hammer taps are all it takes. Because whaling on this thing is a good way to ruin it. We've measured that we want the hinges to pivot at the three and a half inch mark. So that's where we'll place our tube. And then once again, light taps with the hammer, put it back in place. Since our hinges are bigger now, we'll need more clearance. The first thing that has to go is the inner wall of the hinge itself. Then we need to cut into the jam just a bit to allow the hinge to swing. All right, guys, we're ready to install the pockets that are gonna hold the door in place. Now with these things, they generally just kind of bolt up here and it's got a plate that goes to the back. A little tip for you is to put in some aluminum shims in between this pocket and that hinge because just in case you needed to move the door in, you can take these shims out. Without them, once that thing's welded up, there's really no adjustment. These pockets have some adjustment to them, so you want to find the happy medium and kind of cinch them down. That way you've got that adjustment already built in. You're not on one side or the other. With the door closed, we can mark it where we'll have to cut for the pockets to go in. With a quick check, we can tell if it's going to work or not, and then prep it for welding. When you shut the door to weld it, make sure to check the door gap so that it fits well before you burn it in. Then it's time to weld. Now we're ready to remove the stock hinges and these things probably haven't been off in a month of Sundays. So having one of these impact drivers is probably a pretty handy tool to have. The impact driver uses the force of the hammer blow to both dig into the head of the screw and to twist counterclockwise, knocking it loose. A jack to hold up the door is a good way to keep from damaging it. Now that we're certain that the pockets are well placed, it's time for some reinforcement to keep them well placed. This will also prevent the door from flexing under its own weight. After all, it wasn't originally designed to bear that load from this side. Fabricating old school suicide doors is a whole lot of work, but the harder the customization is, the cooler the ride. Well, now you got an idea of what it takes to convert your conventional door to a sexy suicide door. Not much money in materials, less than 300 bucks, but a whole lot of patience and hard work. Well, now we got to figure out a way to get this thing open. That's right, Joe. We still got to put a latch in this thing, a remote door popper, and I'd say it'd probably be a pretty good idea to put some kind of manual release in it for that just in case occasion. Not to mention, we got all those other customizing tricks we want to do to this thing to make it stand out in the crowd. We'll see you then. Today on Detroit Muscle, we're going to latch it, pop it, and French it. Our 49 Ford Custom Project Banana Split gets a latch and some fancy pants automatic poppers, as well as a set of louvers punched into it. It was a groundbreaking design for 1949. 
a post-war Ford two-door just like the hot rod cool cats used to customize. For the first modification, we gave it a pair of iconic suicide doors with many more mods to come, including yellow paint. So we're calling our retro ride project the Banana Split. So don't you guys split, because we got a lot of cool, groovy stuff to show you. And you don't need a pack of Luckies rolled up in your t-shirt sleeve to hang out with us. Now, I'm too young to know what he's talking about, but I can tell you this. We've got to get a latch and a striker installed in that door. Otherwise, there's nothing holding it closed. This is what we're going to use to make all of it work nice and pretty. We've got a two-position latch here. One, two. And you just simply pull this little lever here to make it release. And you got to have a striker. And since we're planning to shave the door handles, well, we got us an electric door popper set up. What you'll do is run a cable from this solenoid to one of your release points. And then, this cool kit we got, it'll apply 12 volts to the back of the solenoid, causing it to pull, releasing the door latch. The kit also includes a manual release cable. This stuff's pretty handy whenever the battery runs down, or let's say you forget the keys in the car. All this stuff came from Summit Racing. Now, the important thing to consider here is placement of your striker, which also determines the placement of your door latch. Thank you, sir. Now, we're going to place our striker right here where the upper hinge used to be. There are a few reasons for putting it here. The most obvious is there's already an access hole, so no cutting involved. Another reason is it'll place this latch right in the center of the door, the safest place in case of an impact. Oh, and finally, there won't be anything inside the door, such as a window track, that we would interfere with. Now check this, we've attached the latch to this piece of angled steel we also did a little cutting on for clearance. This will go on the door, and the only cutting on the door we'll need to do is for the mechanism itself. First thing we need to do is make a hole for our new latch. I'll just take it and mark around the edges to determine the size of the first cut. It's probably going to be a little small, but hey, that's better than cutting it too large. Next, I'll have to go around the corner and chop out a small piece for the leading edge. We're going to be doing some welding, so a little prep work is in order with a small grinder. Then, with the latch reattached to our mounting plate, we can get it moved into position. A few tacks will keep it at home so that we can move on. Well, now that we got that mechanism tacked up and in place, it's time to install the striker so that it matches the latch perfectly. Here's a little trick to show you how to do that. It ought to get you right on the money. Take a marker and tape it to the door so that the tip is as close as possible to the center of this tapered opening here. Then making sure the marker doesn't move, we can shut the door and the marker will show us the vertical positioning of our striker. After that, we'll shut it again and mark the location of the edge of the door. The distance to the seat on the latch from the door edge is measured and marked on the door jamb. And we'll bust out the step drill to make a hole for the striker itself, in addition to using a carbide bit to clear away any obstructions. We'll use some washers to shim the striker out to the proper position, then lightly tighten it down. Check the position of the striker in relation to the latch, then make any adjustments that are necessary. And hey, check it before you slam it. That closes the case on our suicide door conversion project. Oh, with the exception, of course, of our handy dandy door poppers that Tommy showed you earlier. Time to get them working. Whenever installing these, there are a few things that you want to keep in mind to make it a lot easier for you guys to see what's going on. Well, we're going to first snatch off this door. The next thing we need to do is make us a hole here in the door so we can have access to the trigger of the latch assembly. Just like the hole for the latch, we'll draw around the trigger to tell us where it needs to be. It'll be easier to work with if we use a hole saw than if we make the hole the same shape as the trigger.
for our application, well, we're planning to use this mounting point on the latch for our popper and the upper one for the original factory door handle, if it works. And whenever you're mounting these poppers, you want to try to keep them in line. It's just easier that way. Now, I have used pulleys and such before to mount these things in awkward locations, and it works, but it puts a little more strain on the popper. We flip the bracket around to fit better with our mounting location. Then we'll mark the holes for the fasteners that will hold the solenoid in place. With our hose drill, we'll stick the solenoid inside the door and tighten it down. Now, whenever you're mounting up the cables, you don't want them pulled taut. You actually want them to leave a little bit of slack in it so that that popper, well, it can snatch on it. It needs that so that it can build up some inertia to work properly. Now we can attach the cable to the trigger on our latch assembly. You don't want to make the loop too awfully small or too big either. Then we'll crimp the cable clamp down and move on to the solenoid. We'll use an adjustable cable stop on this side to allow us to fine tune it later if need be. Well, all right, I got my wire hooked up, so I'm gonna take this big pyre probe, sling a little juice at it, and see if I can get it to pop. Perfect. During the first third of the 20th century, car manufacturers stamped louvers and hoods for a practical purpose. They allowed engine heat to escape. Then, post-war hot rodders carried on the custom for much of the same reason. Later on, though, street rodders loved louvers for a different kind of cool factor. Ooh, yeah, baby. Nobody knows that better than the folks at Street Rods by Michael in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Michael Young provides street riders with bumper-to-bumper -bumper components, full, complete chassis, and, of course, start-to-finish street rod builds. I'm starting to get a lot more calls on people that want to have uh, complete build cars that are slick all over and, and uh, go, compete in the competition of the shows. You can also bring your rod here to get a professionally stamped set of louvers. These are traditional louvers on the car sitting behind you, also called Henry louvers, which means if you look at this car from the side, you can actually see the motor through the louvers. The standard louver is always a three inch louver. Uh, I just punched a hood for a 32 the day before yesterday and it had four inch louvers in it. I can go all the way up to five. So obviously we came to the right place to get this 49 Ford uh, louver treatment. Now we got a nice canvas to work with, but uh, there's more to it than just punching holes right away. That is correct. Now, depending on the canvas you're working on, well, it's gonna tell you what can happen and what can't. We've got an inner brace that's right across here and another one back here toward the back. And with the shape of this hood, well, we're gonna have to stay from about here toward the center. But the first step is getting it flipped over. Before getting down to the real business, Jason Vassar's got to scrape away 65 years of grime. Then he can get down to applying some craftsmanship. First mapping out where all the three inch louvers will be punched and the spaces between them. Now he follows up with a tape outline. The idea is to make the stagger of the louvers follow the shape of the hood. By the way, the tape's not mandatory, it just helps us see what he's doing. With a heavy hood like ours, it takes two people to work the press. And the first punch is always the hardest. See, what you gotta do is when you're doing this, you're pushing against it, you're making it flat against the, the louver you just punched. That helps you keep them straight. And then with Jason measuring, the back compared to the front, that way we're not crooked. People think that it's just boom, it just happens and it, it doesn't happen, you know? Ready? Yeah. There's a little skill to it, a little luck to it. Said so at the end of the day, it's all about smiles. And after a total of 132 louvers, go ahead and count them, this is what we get, a cool rock and retro design that, well, James Dean would be proud of. 
Well, all right, guys, we're continuing the customization of our old Ford. The next thing we're going to do, we're going to French the antenna. Now, originally, our antenna was located on the front fender, but we're going to move it back here to the quarter panel. We're going to use this piece of exhaust tubing to recess the antenna into the body. I'm going to have to cap off one of the ends so we can mount the antenna inside of it. Now, oftentimes, a drain is overlooked on these things, but a little bitty piece of tubing will fix that problem. A pair of tin snips will work just fine to cut out this little piece. Remember art class in first grade? Well, now you can put it to use. With the base cut out, we need to attach it to the tube that we're going to be using. Of course, you'll want to clean it up just a bit after it's burned in, so a small grinder will take care of that. Then a hole on the bottom will give us a place for a drain that we'll be attaching. I'll bend a little bit of brake line to function as a drain tube, and then cut off a piece that's about seven inches long. Six inches, whatever. I'll clean up the end of it a little bit in preparation for welding. Then she can be burned into the tube. After removing this nut and all the accessories on it, I've got to drill a hole in the base of this thing about the size of that thing, so all of it can slide through. Now we're going to put this thing right in this area. You could go back here, you could go up here, heck, you could even put it up here. It's kind of like the saying, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You just put it wherever tickles your fancy. We'll start with a pilot hole from an eighth inch drill bit, and then we'll bust out a hole saw and gradually work it into a more vertical position as the cut is made. We'll use a carbide bit to shape the fitment of the tube for what we're going for, and then prep it for tacking. A cutting wheel is what we'll use to lob off the extra tube at the top. And then we'll grind off the extra material down flat with the panel. With it flush, we can burn the tube all the way around. A little dressing up will finish it and make it look nice on our quarter panel. I'll also file the inside edge to get rid of any annoying burrs around the lip. Then we can mount the antenna. Well, it's that simple, and it really doesn't take all that long to make this conversion. Now, we do have to address the drain, but that's simple. Drill a hole in the trunk floor and run a hose. You guys might give it a shot. Today on Detroit Muscle, we'll light up our 49 Ford with custom headlight and taillight mods. Hey, it's good to see you again. Today on Detroit Muscle, we're jumping back on our customized 49 Ford Project Banana Split. See, our goal is to show you the light, well, so to speak. You see, we got a couple of mods for the lights that'll help this thing stand out from the crowd. Back in the day, a lot of hot riders would install tiny blue lenses on their car's lights. Eventually, they became known as blue dots. You would see them on both headlights and tail lights, which is where our Ford's getting them. Well, I may not have been around back whenever these things were a common deal, I guess you would say, but I've seen them on a whole bunch of old school rides, so it can't be that hard to do. Guess I better get started. Mm -hmm. What we've got here is everything it's gonna take to make this job happen. First thing that we picked up was a blue dot kit for Mr. Gasket. So then we visit a local glass shop to pick up a few things, like this diamond tip hole saw. We also picked up some putty that we're gonna use to kind of dam up our coolant for cutting. But before we can get started, I've got to get this lens out of the housing. No big deal, just a few screws. Well, I got my bit chucked up into the drill press, a piece of wood that's gonna be a little softer of a base than this steel deck. My plan is to use a little bit of putty on all four corners to help keep the lens located. 
When they made these lenses 65 years ago, they used glass instead of plastic, which is much more difficult to drill. Okay, now we need to center up the lens against our bit. Now I'll make me some of them silly putty snakes to use as a dam for the coolant on the top of the lens. The coolant keeps the glass from accidentally shattering while you cut. When it comes time to drill, use short, light amounts of pressure, up and down, up and down. You may be wondering why I didn't just take and flip this lens over like this and just drill from the inside out. Well, it's because whenever you're drilling through glass especially, well, there's what's called the exit wound. If you look around the rim here, there's a few small chips, but nothing really too bad. But here on the back side, all the way around, there's several huge chips in it. If we would have done it the other way, those huge chips would have been visible from the outside. So now we need to install this pretty little jewel. Well, it looks like the edge of the bezel here is hitting these ribs on the lens. So we'll have to file down each side of the bezel and that should get us there. Once I stick the bezel in, I'll flip the unit over and press down against the table to seat it real well. Then I'll bend out two of the tabs carefully to keep it in place. Now since we just cut a hole in that lens, well you don't want it to get full of water inside of it because it can run into electrical problems down the road. So just a little dab of this Loctite weather strip adhesive will seal it right up. Some acetone on a cotton swab or paper towel will help clean up any extra sealant and give you a nice clean look. With the jewel in, we'll bend the other two tabs to keep it in place. Now to show you the true effect of this thing, I'm gonna have to light it up, but I've got a problem. The light socket, well it's not the greatest. Not to mention, it's wired up for a six volt system. So, it needs a little restoration work done on it. Yeah, that's not supposed to work that way. And keep pulling. We'll take a quick spin by the blaster to clean up the smudge that's built up over the years. Alrighty, with everything all cleaned up, we're going to spray on some Duplicolor paint. The first step, we're going to paint the inside chrome so that it can reflect as much light as possible. I'm going to cram this piece of paper towel inside there to keep the paint out of the socket. And as for the back, some cast iron, engine and apple. With our housing painted, we need to address the wiring, so we got a new pigtail from AutoZone. Some dielectric grease from Loctite is a good idea to use on contacts because it keeps the moisture from gumming them up. So what was the purpose behind this? Sometimes you do things for economy, performance, and then others, you do them to just be plain right cool. Down the road, it's an Oldsmobile headlight swap to give our old Ford some much needed pizzazz. Then later on, it's a custom license plate box. Well, we are back with more lighting mods for the old banana split here. You know, with blues in the back, it's now time for something up front. Since the old days, even before my time, hot riders have been customizing and Frenching headlights with all kinds of treatments to make a smoother look. Here's what we got in store. Our plan is to install a set of headlight bezels out of a 55 Ohls. And this is a very popular conversion with the lead sled guys. Now installing this thing, well, it all depends on what you're trying to put it into. Could be simple or be quite the task. 
One way to go is go ahead and install the bezel and build the body out to it, creating a bug-eyed look. However, we think it'll look a lot better if we recess this bucket so that the light is flush with the body here. To make that happen, we're gonna take this metal strip we just cut, actually make a ring to go around the bucket so we can move it further in. So I'm gonna take this thing first and make a 90 degree bend before we move over to the shrinker. The metal shrinker takes a little bit of pressure at a time in small sections. You move down the length of the metal to create a curve as you go. After you get tired of smashing and shrinking, you gotta do it a little bit more, and then you have your ring a lot like this one. You just simply put it on top of the bucket, and you see here we've gotta trim this piece off because it's in the way of letting it sit down nice and flush. Then we're actually gonna come back and mark off these adjusters and the tab that holds the ring in place. So let's get to cutting first. Now I'm gonna mark where these adjustment tabs are so that I can transfer them to my new ring. The tabs on the light itself have to be able to slip through these. And since all the tabs are different, it's important to get this part right. With a body saw, I can cut them out of our ring lickety split, then weld it together at the seam. A little grinding is in order to clean up the welds and then we can move on. <laughs> it fits like a charm. Now we need to replicate the factory mounting holes in the same location. So we'll just drill through the old holes. With our ring attached to our bucket, you can see what we were trying to accomplish. Now it looks like we could build a tab similar to this one on the stock fender and weld it to our ring. And that'll keep the orientation of the headlight in the exact location we need it and still allowing us to adjust it if need be. These tabs also need to be the correct size and in the correct position. So while I draw them out, I'll also number them to keep them straight. With four of them in all, I can cut them out. Then I'll weld them on the outer lip of the ring in the same position as their counterpart. Some more grinding will clean them up real nice. Then we'll drill through the same place as earlier to locate the new mounting holes. With that, we can mount the light back onto the car. And you can see that it's now recessed into the fender. We have to build up the top of the fender out just a little bit to meet the bezel. So some tape will protect it from any sparks. I'll use a straight edge to figure out where the new metal needs to go to make the fender meet the bezel. Then a cardboard template can be whittled up for the piece that goes in here. I'll replicate the template onto some 18 gauge steel and cut it out. Then we can begin shaping it to make the seamless transition to the bezel. Once it's good to go, I'll grind down the primer so that we can weld it in place. I need to make a relief cut on the top to help it fit better. And then I'll weld it back together once the pieces are better attached. Once we dressed up the welds, well, we'll put our new bezel in place. And dang! Look at that big difference that it makes on the front end. Well, we've given our old Ford kind of a headlight and taillight treatment today, and we're going to continue doing some customization on it by doing a recessed license plate box. We started out by building a simple box out of some 18 gauge steel. This one is made so that the edges are bent onto it instead of being welded on. The corners will be round and I'll use a grinder disc as a radius to mark where we'll bend them. Now you can mount this thing crooked, however you want, or just kind of standard. But before you do all that, and cut a big, huge hole in the back of this thing, I gotta do a little bit more weld. A body hammer and dolly with a radius edge are what we'll use to give our corners a nice round look. Once they're all rounded, we'll take a cutting wheel and slice through the two layers to let us weld them back together. Hey, 
After we've done all four, we'll grind off the extra base plate that's sticking out. Finish welding up the box and then dress up all the welds. We went ahead and drew us a center line on our deck lid, and earlier we drew the center line on our box. So now all you have to do is kind of use that calibrated eyeball, line it up, and then trace around it. A body saw will make quick work of cutting out the hole where our new box will go. We had to drill a few spot welds too, no biggie. The inside structure is going away as well which means we'll need to come back later on and install a new latch for the trunk. The primer needs to be ground off where we're about to weld. Then once we've made sure it fits nicely, we can start burning in the box. We'll cut the edges down so that they're almost flush with the deck lid. Then grind everything down so that it's nice and pretty. Well, there you guys go. It only took a couple of hours to end up with a whole lot of cool. Today on Detroit Muscle, more old school tricks as our Flathead Custom gets a new stance with Trick Kingpin spindles and an upgrade from ancient drums to disc brakes. Detroit Muscle's banana split is back after several scoops of cool cosmetic work. From a killer suicide door treatment to popping a set of custom louvers on the hood. We modified the look of the headlights and blue dotted the taillights. Put a peak on the nose and a recessed license plate box out back. Well, we even modified a Chrysler front bumper for it and Frenched in the antenna. Okay, so much for the decorative details. Now it's time to give this 49 Ford some proper power and performance. We just removed our factory flathead V8, making way for something new, kinda. We're sticking with that tradition that started back in 32. And since Ford produced them for 20 plus years, flathead V8s are still popular and fairly plentiful. Before the 50s, they were the engine choice for hot rodders and racers. Today, they're mostly valued for nostalgic appeal and unique looks. I mean, what's not unique about an engine with no valve covers? Recently, the guys down at Engine Power plucked one from a local boneyard a Gen 3 version made from 1949 to 53. Tearing down one of these jewels is an adventure all in itself. You even need a special tool to remove the valve springs. It's a good idea to keep a couple fingers crossed while you clean the block. That's because flatties were notorious for overheating, which led to nasty cracks. In fact, this one had a couple of small cracks that required some machine shop surgery before they could freshen it up. Back home, they filled the block with new aftermarket parts while keeping everything old school, like the Edelbrock heads and one of their vintage tri-power intakes. On the engine dyno, with 26 degrees of timing, the old girl made 159 horsepower and 253 foot-pounds of torque. That's a far cry from the 100 horsepower of our stock 239 flatty. And the best part is, they're gonna let us put it to good use powering up our 49 Ford. But before we slip that pretty little thing in, we're gonna go ahead and get started on the front end. Because with all that sheet metal out of the way, there's plenty of room to work. Hey, here's a little Ford factoid for you. This setup here on our 49 represents Ford Motor Company's first attempt at an independent front suspension. All the predecessors used a straight axle, which is not known for comfort and drivability. In fact, if you ever rode an original 32 Roadster, it's about like riding in a donkey car. This Mustang II spindle is the kind we're most accustomed to. It attaches to the wheel and the lower and upper control arms, and they move as a unit. On the other hand, what makes this one unique is this kingpin here. Now, this part remains stable while it's attached to the control arms. However, it's this middle part here that's involved with all the turning. Well, in a nutshell, we've given the Ford a new attitude. Now it needs an altitude adjustment. We gotta bring it down a couple of inches after we get her tore down. Once the dust cap is removed, we can spin off the castle nut and remove the brake drum. The rest of the old brake assembly is attached to the mounting flange with four bolts. 
and we can just cut the old brake lines since we're replacing them. Another castle nut holds on the tie rod end, which we can then knock off with a hammer. See this little pin here? It's a set pin holding in the kingpin. Remove the set pin and the kingpin comes out. So how's it going, Joe? Man, I thought that little pin was gonna pin me to the mat. <laughs> for the big one though, I think it's time for the kingpin of Detroit Muscle. Man, this hammer ain't gonna work. I need a left-handed hammer. Make do. First order of business, I'm gonna remove this nut and then tap that bolt back in a little bit. And I'm gonna do the same down here at the bottom. The reason I'm doing that is this pin is gonna be driven down toward the ground and I need the extra clearance. This is another dust cap, which keeps the nasties from getting to the kingpin. Now we're gonna get really scientific. We're gonna use this giant bolt and this big old hammer and whoop a fire out of it. All right, now we're ready to remove this upright, and to do that, I've got to remove this bolt and this lower bolt. I went ahead and put a jack under the control arm to support that spring because it's got some tension under it. I don't want things to get too exciting too fast, if you know what I'm saying. Still ahead. We're gonna get our Ford to sit down in the dirt with some lowering mods. Hey, we're back with more front end finagling on our 49 Ford. After removing the parts that we're gonna replace, it's now about time to inspect the ones that are going on the car. As we told you, our goal is to lower the car a couple of inches, and there was a time when guys would do this a couple of different ways. Now, one was to take the factory upright and simply invert it. Fine, right? Well, it would totally screw up the camber. Another was to heat up or even cut the springs, which was great if you don't mind losing your suspension travel and screwing up your geometry. Fat Man Fabrications eliminates those old issues with this setup that boats directly to the factory control arms. To begin with, they lower the car with this drop upright that also preserves spring travel and geometry. Now that would lower the tie rod ends two and a half inches, and to fix that, well, they offer this drop steering arm. Also, they've been able to improve on the steering components, for example, by replacing the rubber bushings on the idler arm with needle bearings, and they've re-engineered the tie rod ends to eliminate bump steer. We'll be using the stock mounting flange and spindle, along with this new surface bearing that came in the kit. You know the king pin is in the proper position because you can see the notch where the side pin holds it in place. Now for the new dust cap. The greaser can then be installed to keep things nice and slick. Then the steering arm goes into place. An idle arm adapter bracket can then be mounted to the frame. Along with the new idler arm. got a new center link to connect the steering box and the idler arm. Then we can move on to the tie rods. One for the passenger side, one for the driver's side, 
each connecting the center link to the steering arm. Now look, we wanted a simple, straightforward way to convert our brakes from drums to discs, and we found a source that fits the bill called Engineered Components, Inc. They offer this complete kit for 1937 to 64 Fords, all new stuff, including rotors, calipers and pads, uh, bracketry, hoses, uh, seals and bearings, everything to get the deal done. There are a few specially engineered plates that go in place to allow the disc brakes to mount to our old Ford, and some spacers that go in between them. There's another spacer that goes onto our factory spindle, which will set the disc out where it needs to be to operate correctly. With a nicely packed bearing in place, we can assemble the rest of the disc components and keep it all together with our factory castle nut. And yes, the kit comes with a cotter pin you'll need to finish it off. Now for the caliper. With the pads in place, it slips onto the disc, then you just fasten it down. The last thing we need to swap out is this old master cylinder because it doesn't have enough oomph, if you will, to support that new disc brake setup. For an upgrade, we went to Engineered Components Inc. again and opted for one of their master cylinder adapter kits. It comes with a third gen Corvette Master for plenty of stopping power. And one nice thing is we get to use our old stock pedals and pivot shaft. It also comes with a boot, shaft, and all the hardware it takes to install it. The pedal assembly goes back in the factory location with the new bracket as a placeholder for the original master cylinder. Then the bracket for the new cylinder goes behind the cross member. Has to be welded in, so we got to make some marks for the mounting locations and grind them down for welding. You want to make sure the unit is straight and plumb so that the cylinder is actuated in a straight line. With rubber cap removed, the plunger rod can then be mounted. Don't forget to hook up the return spring. Adjusting the length of the rod is important. You want about a sixteenth of an inch of play in the pedal before it begins to push the cylinder. Well, now we just have to take a few of these items off so I can weld this bracket solid to the cross member. Tell you what, we're getting closer and closer each time to taking this thing for a ride. With us dropping the front end of Project Banana Split about two inches in the front, well, we've got to do something back here because it's going to look plain right silly with the back end all hopped up. The tail end of this thing is going to sit a lot closer to the dirt. Yeah, lowering the back end of an 04 like that's a pretty easy deal, but we have seen it done wrong. So to do the job right, we're going to use this lowering kit from Summit Racing that comes with four U-boats with hardware, plus a pair of these aluminum lowering blocks. We're getting two inch blocks under our Ford, but you can go from one to four inches. Some WD-40 Specialist Rust Release Penetrant Spray will help us loosen these U-boats up real easy like. Then we can remove them. Simply insert the block and line it up using the dowels. The new U-bolts go into the original locations and then we'll chop off their excess length. There you go. After we put new front brakes, new front suspension, and lowered this old girl about two inches from stem to stern, I tell you, she's starting to look like a custom ride for sure. You bet. And after we add, well, several hundred pounds of engine, trans, uh, front end, doors and such, you'll get a real feel for the new ride height. But that's all after we give it some spiffy yellow paint and let it live up to its name, Banana Split. 
Today on Detroit Muscle, we're going to fling some fiberglass, file some filler, and plant some paint. Banana Split is getting skirts, body work, and she's going yellow. Our 49 Ford Custom Cruiser Project, lovingly dubbed Banana Split, came to us as a plain Jane coupe. But after a myriad of mods and custom crafting, she's turning into a one-of-a-kind throwback to the hot rod era. Speaking of the hot rod era, remember how insanely cool those lead sleds look with a pair of bulging fender skirts? Well, they say you can put lipstick on a pig, but we're gonna see what it looks like when you put a skirt on a banana. We picked up a set of fiberglass skirts that are designed to fit our application, but you guys know, working with fiberglass parts, it's kinda like the saying, square peg, round hole. So I'll bet we're gonna have to do a little bit of whittling to make these things fit. Thank you, sir. Now, this thing is pretty simple to install. It's got a big main clamp that goes inside and attaches to the middle of the wheel well and two smaller clamps that attach and get tightened to the quarter pound. We picked up this set for about 270 bucks. They may bolt on as advertised, but the fit leaves a lot to be desired. With the skirts attached, we can see there's a lot of work to be done. These gaps will have to be addressed so they'll fit flush against the quarter. In fact, the entire piece fails to follow the contour of the body. Well, we just kicked the booth on and there's reason because there's gonna be a large amount of fiberglass debris in the air. Cause we're gonna have to slice and dice this thing just to make it fit the quarter panel. But it's kind of like what I've said before. It may be broke, but it ain't plumb broke till you can't fix it no more. Working with itchy fiberglass is a good time to swap to long sleeves. To start with, let's make a mark where we'll trim away some of the skirt so that it can lay flatter against the quarter. Eventually, we'll be putting filler on the edges, so we'll go ahead and lay down some masking tape so that it doesn't adhere to the body. We can start deciding where to make slices in this thing in order to reshape it. We won't cut all the way through, so at least it will stay attached to the car while it gets formed. Some tape here keeps the slices flush to the body while we work on the other parts. A tiny pie slice will let us re-angle the skirt from here forward. We'll continue to tape the pieces to the body as we go so that it forms to the corner. Another pie slice needs to happen here so that we can have enough room to form the skirt. We're just about ready to start throwing some fiberglass, but before I do that, I've got to grind out all these incisions to give me a a space for that material to lay. It's just like welding. If you don't have that, it's a weak joint, and we don't want that at all. When you're working with this stuff, we can't stress enough that you need the proper safety equipment. Those tiny fiberglass shards are sharp, and they'll wreak havoc on your eyes and lungs, especially. Well, all right, guys, we're ready to glue this thing back together to a single piece. I've got my resin, some hardener, and some cloth. All we gotta do now is mix it all up. This resin hardens fairly quickly, but you do have a few minutes after you mix it to get your material applied. Make sure that you use your brush to get plenty of the resin into the fiber strips with nice saturation.
And no, it's not very pretty when you first apply it, but that's why you have to body work it. With the resin hardened, now the skirt can be pulled off the car. Okay, now we have to repeat that same process on the front here on the back. That way it kind of is twice as strong where the bond is. We don't want this thing to blow off while we're riding down the road. Once all of it is cured, a DA sander will do the rough work for us, smoothing out the strips of new glass and blending them into the original material. We'll step down from 36 grit to 80 so we can do some more detail work and smooth out the entire surface. Well, all right, guys, we got our skirt back on the car and it fits a whole lot better than it did before, but there's still some imperfections that we're gonna have to fix. And to do that, I'm gonna use some short strand reinforced filler to dial it in. This is the reason for all that masking tape we put on the body earlier. It helps us fill in the gaps completely flush with the quarter without sticking to it. Then the splices will need some too so that we can make it look nice. Time for the sanding block to come out. Use it in an X pattern to get it roughed in and ready for fine tuning. Still ahead, we've got to sculpt the peak on our Ford's hood. Stick around. We're moving forward on our custom Ford's bodywork. And you may remember we punched a set of louvers, then laid down some metal to put a peak on the hood. In addition, we also adapted a set of 55 Olds headlights to add a little more pizzazz to the front. Okay, now we need to follow up that metal work with some filler starting here on the hood. And where this body line was installed, well, that's gonna require some serious sculpting. All the supplies we're gonna be using came from Single Source, our go-to paint and body distributor network. Looks like you got it all, what's first? Well, first off, we gotta do a little bit of sanding. You mind doing that? A Little bit, okay. Right. Go ahead, take the roll. Thank you. The first thing we gotta do is roughen up the primer around the bare metal. This will provide some tooth for the first layer of filler to mechanically adhere to the surface. That first layer will be the reinforced variety for a good, strong foundation. Be sure to squish it down into the crevices on your metal work. It's almost ready. There's a window of opportunity that's ideal for sanding this stuff. That's when it's hard enough to adhere to the hood, but still malleable enough to work with the sandpaper. Otherwise, when it gets completely cured, it's hard as rock. Then a finer layer of reinforced filler can be applied over your first. This layer should get you closer to the rough shape of the peak that you want. We're using a rounded sanding block to give us a nice curve from the top to the bottom of the peak. Make sure to blow it off really well so that you reveal any holes that succeeding layers of filler can take care of. The tougher the filler, the more likely there will be little pockets like this. We got our foundation set with that green filler. Now we're gonna apply just what you call like your run of the mill body filler. Now this stuff sands a whole lot easier and it's a lot easier to shape.
whenever you're shaping stuff like this, you have to look with your eyes and your hand. And sometimes you gotta do kind of a single stroke just to get it dialed in perfect. If you just went to hogging on it, a lot of times you'll actually create a lot more work. Last up, we can move to a glaze style filler, which is the finest bodied variety, as well as the nicest for top surface appearance. The wedge side of this block will let you tune the shape exactly. Up next, we'll show you a body working trick for curved surfaces, then start spraying. We went ahead and dropped our fender off of our old Ford in here to do the body work around the headlight conversion that we did. I've wiped it once with that reinforced filler, and I'll have to wipe it one more time with just standard plastic filler. But whenever you're doing body work like this, there are a few blocking techniques that you should keep in mind. Whenever you're working with a curve panel, you don't really want to use a hard block because it won't conform to the panel. You're a lot better off if you've got something a little more flexible that'll give you that nice round shape. The idea here is to make the mounting flange for the headlight bezel flow seamlessly into the factory contour of the fender. Well, like Tom showed you a second ago, Using the flat side of a paint stirrer makes a great sanding block on a curved surface like this. We still have to finish the final sanding for the body itself, and a few passes with some Dupacolor guide coat will do the trick for us by showing where any high or low spots are. Then it's into the spray booth and time to mask. There's really two reasons for the way we're going to mask this car. Number one, to keep the paint from getting onto the surfaces where we don't want it. But there's also another one. We haven't finished resurfacing the inside and the underside of this car yet. And we want to keep any nasty stuff from blowing out onto our new paint. Rust flakes and debris from under the car can ruin a nice paint job pretty quickly. Well, we're all masked up and ready to start spraying. And what we're gonna use all the way from primer to clear coat is from the Summit Racing line of paint products. First, we'll lay down a coat of this primer sealer to provide a consistent foundation for the paint and provide a tie coat that helps the paint adhere to the car. Since both of our base colors are going to be light, in order to help them pop a little more, it helps to use a light colored sealer like this gray. Once you apply sealer, you have a certain amount of time to get base coat on the car. Be sure to hit in that window Otherwise, it'll have to be sanded off and reapplied. After the break, we'll mix some custom yellow for the old banana. Well, we got our car all sealed up and we're ready to start applying some color. The first thing we're gonna do is spray on some of this milk white that we got from Summit Racing, and then we're gonna spray on some yellow, but that's going on the side. It can be a little tough spraying very similar colors on top of each other, but this is where being consistent with your movement patterns is key. It keeps you from striping it up. Well, our base coat is plenty dry enough so that we can do some taping. This old Ford, it's going to get a pretty simple two-tone. I'm going to break it right here on this factory body line. That simple. One simple thing to know when it comes to masking paper, try not to force it in a direction that it doesn't want to go. 
If you do, it can pull up from the surface and allow paint underneath. Let it lay like it wants, then seal any gaps with tape. After all, tape's pretty cheap. Well, we're ready to start mixing up some yellow. Summit offers this awesome color called Go Banana, but it's a little bit too intense for what we're looking for. We're wanting something a little bit more like banana pudding, if you will. Now, what our plan is, is to take some of this yellow, mix it with some white over here, and then we'll have us that awesome color. Don't forget to zero out your scale before you start adding paint. Then you can pour in your main color. Be sure to write down how much of it is there. Now we'll start slowly adding white to knock back that yellow just a bit. Be sure to stir it well before you add any more. We've managed to get that nanner pudding look we're going for. We'll just write down the amount of white we added and we can make more just like it anytime. We'll spray all the material on this car with a 50% overlap between each pass of the gun. This will ensure nice, even coverage. We've set this HVLP gun to 20 pounds of air pressure as well. After three coats of base, we're ready to unmask it and reveal the two-tone. All right, guys, we've got our yellow sprayed on, our white sprayed on, the car unmasked, and we're ready to spray on some clear. We're gonna go with the high solid urethane that we got from Summit Racing as well. This thing is gonna be awesome, and it's time to make it shiny. This two-stage paint system is a far cry from the stoving enamel paint methods that were common in the year the Ford was manufactured which was a sprayed on coating that had to be cured at 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Manufacturers were still experimenting with base coat clear coat systems well into the 70s. With the body sprayed and pulled out, the last bit of wet sanding will prep the rest of the panels for their trip to the spray booth. The doors, fenders, hood, and deck lid. And with the yellow and white sprayed and all the assembly we can do for now, well, you get a good idea what she looks like. A banana split, of course. Yeah, we still got a pretty good amount of work to do before we can put her all back together, but I think we're hitting the home stretch of this big old custom cruiser. Today on Detroit Muscle, we're gonna quiet it down, cool it off, and wire it up. We'll show you how to lay down sound and heat insulation, simplify a whole car wiring job, install a hopped up flathead, and restore a 65-year-old steering wheel. Detroit Muscle is back with another helping of Banana Split. Now this old 49 Ford is going to be getting a dose of the silent treatment because 65-year-old cars were never really known for their sound control. And we'd whole lot rather be able to ride around and listen to some good old rock and roll tunes as opposed to all that noise. So before we even think about interior work, we're gonna give all the inside services a coating of this sound control formula from Lizard Skin. We've used this stuff on previous project rides and it always proved to be sound insurance, pun intended. Now their companion product is this ceramic insulation, which we'll follow up with after this. All right, guys, we got the inside of the car all prepped out. Now we want to make sure that we don't get any overspray on the outside. So with a little bit of tape, some paper, and a little bit of time, we'll be in good shape. Yeah, well, I got plenty of paper and tape. I'll see if I can find you some time. No, no, don't run off. I'm going to need some just help. Just kidding, just kidding. First thing we'll do is mask off any holes so the lizard skin doesn't blow out into the paint. Then we can do the same on the body panels. Since we're spraying in the trunk, the quarter panels will need to be protected as well, and the door jams for when we spray the floor pan. 
Now, since most paint sprayers won't handle the thickness of this coating, your best bet is to get one of these application kits Lizard Skin makes that even includes this handy dandy mixer that attaches to your drill. Make sure you plunge the mixer up and down in the material so that you can get a good mix. It takes about five minutes to get it good and ready, then we can spray. You want to apply the first coat at about a half a millimeter thickness, spraying six to nine inches from the substrate. Then you let the first coat dry and then lay down a second pass. After it's dried for 24 hours, you're ready for the next step. With our sound deadening applied, we're ready to spray on our thermal coating. Now it's the same exact procedure, just a different material. The thermal material gets mixed in the same fashion as the sound dead. With the sound control, you want to spray with the air pressure at 40 to 60 PSI. And with a thermal ceramic installation, you want to use 50 to 70 PSI. We're also using the insulation on the roof to cut down on heat from the sun and on the floor to block out the engine and transmission heat. Okay, now that we're done with the floor, we're at a good point to drop our engine and transmission back into our old Ford. Now this engine is putting out about 150% of the power that our original was, and we wanna make sure that our clutch can handle all that. Used to be you would be in a bind if you were looking for a high performance clutch option for a flathead and a three speed. But American Powertrain has solved that issue with this new combo of clutch and pressure plate that can withstand those higher power levels. Together with this flywheel, also from American Powertrain, our clutch setup will have smoother engagement, greater clamping force, and all with less leg effort. We'll use some AutoZone brake cleaner to clean off the flywheel. Then we can bolt on our new clutch and pressure plate. Then we can hang the bell housing in place and bolt it down as well. There goes that little old three-speed. Oh, one cool thing about this car, we're gonna keep that column shifter. But more about that some other time. Well, with our trans bolted up to this hopped up flathead, we're ready to send them both home in the Ford. Now, since it came with a flathead originally, uh, this should be an easy deal. You'll see if it fits as well as we think. Might as well. If you do a lot of engine installs, one of these Matco engine tilters on your cherry picker can be a lifesaver. And it's as easy as that. Well, we are back after bolting up the engine and trans in our Ford, and well, now comes the job that strikes fear in the hearts of many a gearhead, wiring. But we're fortunate on two counts. First, we got Scott from Ron Francis Wiring to help out and one of their bare bones kits. Well, as we know, the stock 49s were a six volt system. We're gonna upgrade to 12 volts, but we wanna keep the factory gauges and they're six volts. So how are we gonna do that? I think we have something to help you out with that. All right. But first, we gotta mount the panel. Okay, I'll wait. The Bare Bones Kit got its name because it's one of the simpler setups that Ron Francis offers, which is perfect for this car. But if you've got something a little more complicated to deal with, they have you covered with multiple levels of complexity. We're gonna punch a hole in the tow board to run the main hot wire, but we'll be sure to use a grommet to prevent any wire fraying. Next up is mounting the starter solenoid, which will live on the firewall. An eyelet needs to be crimped onto the end of the hot wire, then it can be attached to the solenoid. So I'm about to install the alternator feed wire, but before I do, I'm going to install some of this new product that we're offering. It's a fabric braided heat shrink wire covering. So it goes on like a wire covering, but then you can heat it up and it actually shrinks down on the wire for a nice clean installation. And the coolest part is once you are all done, it looks like a fabric wire covering. Then the feed wire can be attached to the alternator along with the solenoid. 
All right, guys, we're ready to start wiring up our cluster, but before we get too carried away, we have to do a little bit of detective work because otherwise you probably hook up these gauges wrong and it's gonna damage everything. Okay, what we can see here is each gauge has two posts, one being six volts, the other being for the sending unit. When you look at how these gauges are wired, we find that several of them are tied together, which tells us this is a six volt SIN. The original manufacturers were really good at not marking the backs of these gauges. So the proper thing to do would be to mark them as we remove the wires so we know exactly what's going on here. Now that they're marked, the hot wires can be removed from the gauges. Next, the sending wires can come off. And then the gauge light wires can be cut because those will be rewired as well. Pull out the bulb housings and set them aside and see if there's any loose dirt or crud inside the cluster. One last thing we can do is mark the back of the gauges as to what each one does. With the new hot wires prepped, they can be attached to their posts. Then with the new guts in the bulb housings, they can be reinstalled as well. Now we can attach the sending wires. All right, Scott, I guess at last we get the lowdown on how we get to use these six volt gauges with our 12 volt system. Yep, what we got here is a voltage reducer that takes 12 volts and reduces it down to six. Simple three wire hookup, you just have ground, 12 volts in, you get six volts out. We'll use our Power Pro 4 to test each of the gauges and lights, then mount the reducer next to the distribution block on the kick panel. You know, back in 49, when you drove one of these Fords, you didn't have turn signals, unless you count your left hand. Well, we're getting ready to change all that. We're gonna install this unit from Ron Francis Wiring. Now we've already attached a connector to it. So all we gotta do is attach it to the steering column, plug it in and we're ready. Luckily, this is overall a very simple wiring job. And thanks to Scott's skills, it's almost done. Most of the wires are run and without our lights installed yet, the most we can do is string the wires out to where they'll be. But with the cluster installed, the dash can be laid in place and then cinched down. The ignition switch from Ron Francis is ready to be wired up as well. Then it can be installed in the dash. We also got a light switch from them, which is ready to go in place as well. Without the fuel system and fenders installed, that's about as far as we can go today. Scott, I can't thank you enough for getting us started on this project and for demystifying some of this wiring business. Yeah, it's just another day in the office. All right, well, I think we're all amped up to finish this project now. You got us going. No problem. We've got one more restoration project that we're wanting to do on our old Ford, and that is redoing a steering wheel. This is our original, and it's looking pretty rough. Now this is the one we're wanting to swap to. Now it's seen its better day, but it's definitely restorable. It's off of an early model Cadillac, and that was a common practice back in the day. Take items off of a more expensive car and put them on yours. It was kind of a easy upgrade. What happens to these old things after years of exposure to the sun? Well, they kind of dry out and crack, but it's no big deal. It can be repaired. The first thing that we have to do is kind of defunkinize it. And what we're going to do is spray it down with some of this Duplicolor prep spray, wipe it down to get all the oils off of it because you got to think about all of them driving hours on it. You don't know what's on that thing. With that done, now we need to remove these little pieces of jewelry, if you will. It's no real big deal. We'll just sip the wheel down and using a hammer and a roll pin punch, knock them off. Now we can get to sanding this old thing. There are two reasons for this. First, we're gonna lay down some filler from the steering wheel repair kit that we got, and we need to give the surface some mechanical adhesion for the filler itself. 
The second reason is that you want to create a bevel in the cracks, just like if you were welding. It'll make the repair much stronger. The repair kit was about 60 bucks, and if you can, that's what you want to use, because this compound is suited for the durability required on a steering wheel. Be sure to squish it down into the cracks, and when you're laying it out, treat it a lot like regular body filler. Don't glom it on. Work smarter instead of harder. After 24 hours, it's ready to be body work. Be sure to see how well it filled the crack and go back with another coat if you need to. Then we'll hit it and the center with a coat of white sealer primer to provide a uniform tie coat for our paint to follow. Now you can do the same procedure with a rattle can paint and primer, but this activated urethane will be much more durable. After that, a little more paint, along with a nice tiny brush, is a good way to recoat the area around our emblem. Well, there you go, it turned out pretty nice, and it gives you a sneak peek of what our interior is gonna look like. And I have to say, that's definitely an upgrade. Today, Banana Split, our lowered 49 Ford, goes back together. We're hanging panels from louvers to skirts and chrome from the grill to the ground. Plus, how the wide whites were made that we're going to be bolting onto this beauty. And we'll make our flathead breathe by acid porting our headers. We're coming down to the home stretch on our 49 Ford Custom Project Banana Split. We've got her painted and the flathead is sitting pretty in the engine bay. So now's the time to begin final assembly. And that's gonna consist of getting all the panels hung back on this car, along with all of our shiny chrome stuff. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see this thing put together. Besides the panels, there's a few other things that we need to hit on, and that is the wheels and tires. Now, these old bias ply we have here are dry rotted and practically unsafe, because you can almost see the air on the inside of them. Not to mention the wheels themselves, well, they're all rusted and pitted and the wrong size, so we're going to have to get some more. But that's one nice thing about a steel wheel, is they're pretty inexpensive to just replace. That's right. The replacement rollers we're going with are a set of Coker Steel 15x6s. Now, they replicate the factory wheel look, but they're an inch taller and an inch wider. The tires, also from Coker, are a set of American Classic white walls that feature polyester steel construction. One cool thing about these is that while they look like original bias plies, they're actually a modern radial. That way you get to have your cake and eat it too. Classic looks with a modern ride handling and safety. You know, tires may look a lot alike, but there are some big differences on the inside. Now, older bias ply tires, like the ones found on the Ford, are constructed by laying out the plies at a 45-degree angle from the center line of the tire. That results in a stiff sidewall, increased rolling resistance, and a harsher ride. For the next evolution in tires, manufacturers added fiberglass reinforced belts to the bias plies. These became popular during the late 60s on muscle cars due to their wide footprint. A radial tire simply means that the overlapping plies are laid at a 90 degree angle to the center line of the tire, followed by steel belts. This produces a more flexible tire that handles better and reduces rolling resistance. Well, watching an animation on different tire types is one thing, but we actually got a chance to see how these modern white walls are made. It's all done by hand, starting with the steel cord bead that's set on a drum, followed by a thin rubber inner liner. Then sheets of rubber-infused polyester are overlapped on a 30-degree bias to add strength. Hydraulic fingers compress these components as an air bladder rolls and fuses them to beads. Then the white strips are added, followed by a thick tread compounded from raw rubber, tire black, and oil. It's added to the drum and spliced. Then the entire unit is rolled and fused. These tires are ready for curing. Curing takes place here in large clamshell presses that house the original molds. Here, green tires are compressed under 200,000 pounds of clamping force and vulcanized at 330 degrees. 
After a 25-minute cycle, a bladder retracts and the form tire is removed and inflated to maintain its shape as it cools. Next in the finishing area, tires are again mounted and inflated, this time on buffing machines where they're spun and a fine ridge stone precisely dresses the sidewall, leveling and smoothing it into a perfect white wall. The last steps are inspection and labeling, followed by a spray-on coating to keep the white wall clean. Then, a final protective plastic wrap for shipping. Now, in order to make our wheels match the red interior we're putting in the Ford, we're painting them red like we did this one as a test. Looks pretty neato, doesn't it? Then we're gonna cap them off, so to speak, with these big old uptight out of sight hubcaps. I can't wait for that, but first, we gotta get the rest of them painted red. Some Duplicolor Wax and Grease Remover will be the first step. You wanna do this before you sand, because if there's any contaminants on the wheel, sanding it will embed them deeper into the surface. Then a Scotch-Brite pad will help roughen it up for the paint to get some good mechanical adhesion. After blowing the dust off, go over it one more time with that wax and grease remover for good measure. Well, I think we're pretty clean. Ready to do some masking? Yeah, got a razor blade. Gotta be very careful, especially with that white sidewall. The trick to masking off a tire like this is to go ahead and let the tape hang over the edge as you lay it down. Then cut the excess off with a razor blade. Be sure to push the edge of the tape down against the tire to keep overspray from getting on it. With the center of our wheel trimmed out, we're ready to finish masking it up. But here's a little tip for you. What you want to do is stack the tape kind of like shingles from the outside in. What this does, it helps prevent the overspray from getting up under it. It just allows it to flow right across. Now we can bust out some red Duplicolor enamel and start making that wheel red. Be sure to get around the outside of the lip. Hey, while you were gone, we went ahead and put the front panels back on our old Ford. We decided to use some stainless steel bolts from ARP to fasten them on because they'll look really good on there. We'll also get our hood planted in place along with the filler panel. We've pretty much got all the sheet metal bolted to the front side of our Ford. Now we're ready to move on to the bright work. Now we dropped off all our chrome at advanced plating to have it redone and then boys knocked it out of the park like they always do. Now I've got to put this grill back together one of you guys happen to have a photo of one of these? This grill was originally riveted together, but we're light years from a factory restoration and these bolts will do the job just fine and dandy. We'll use some nylon locking nuts and flat washers to keep everything in place. With the center section assembled, it's easier to put the rest of the grill together on the car itself. You can definitely see how designs of this era were heavily inspired by aviation aesthetics. With it all bolted up, we've got ourselves a nice big shiny grill on our hot rod Ford. Now you might remember that for the front bumper, we took a larger one from our Chrysler and chopped it up to fit the Ford. The main idea was more chrome real estate up front for more bling. Now there's no denying those boys over at Advanced Plating sure did make my work look really good. I don't wanna say they had their work cut out, but it looks nice. Now is a good time to get our headlights reinstalled and these modified buckets we made 
utilizing bezels from a 55 Oldsmobile. With our wheel all dry, we can go ahead and bolt it on. After I get it cinched down, I got something special for you guys. We finally get to see what the skirts look like, all shiny, mounted on our Ford. Let's see how this thing goes. These skirts originally had some brackets that mounted them to the body, but we've got a way to improve on them. Now we fabbed up a new bracket because that one that came in the kit was a little bit hokey and we didn't want any casualties riding around, so we took care of that. The hubcaps have a bit of a security feature on them which consists of a bracket that fastens down under a couple of the lug nuts. Then we can attach the middle bracket, which will hold the cap in place, and cut off the extra metal. Then you slip the hub cap on, nice and easy, and a bolt that utilizes a special tool that keeps your hub caps from walking away. Our old hot rod has come a long way from when we first puttered it into the shop. From its humble, rusty, primer gray origins to an attention-grabbing yellow street machine with oceans of chrome and lots of classy custom mods to make it our own. It's a true vision of the kind of hot rods that the first speed demons were modding up in the early days of the hobby. We are back, ready to try out something on this exhaust manifold we took off our Ford. In fact, it's an old sneaky trick racers used to try when they competed in classes requiring stock components. Quite simply, it involves filling up the manifold full of muriatic acid, which ate away some of the material inside and created more volume. And we all know, the more flow, the more go. Now you might be thinking, why not just grind out the material right here, which would be easy, but also obvious to the tech guys. First though, we're gonna to have to get rid of this piece of tailpipe that's attached to the manifold. And for these nuts, well, we're gonna to have to lay on some WD-40 Specialist Rust Release Penetrant Spray. Okay. Now, take this thing over to the blast cabinet and make it look a little better. Well, that's as good as it's gonna get on the outside at least. Well, while you were busy sandblasting away, I whittled out a couple of these plates so that we can block off those ports to fill it up with the acid. Well, let's get busy. Some Loctite silicone gasket maker will help us keep the acid from leaking out of the manifold. Then we can start attaching the caps to the inlets. We'll bolt them on, but they don't have to be tightened down very much since the silicone will be doing the sealing for us. Now there is a method to our madness of having this end open to pour out of the acid, and it's all about air pockets. If we had this end open, we probably have one right here. This way, we get a good even burn throughout. Of course, we want to determine the effectiveness of the acid and see how much material it takes out with a little test. We're going to fill the thing full of water before and after the treatment and we'll compare the volume on the scales. Not to mention, this little test will check to see if we have any leaks before the acid goes in. We'll zero out our scale with the container on it, then fill it with the water we dumped into the manifold which tells us that we've got 29.9 fluid ounces, and that equates to 884.24 cc's of total volume. Then we can take the manifold outside and fill it with muriatic acid and let it work for about two hours. We'll repeat this process four times in total, washing it out and starting with fresh acid each time. And after four acid cycles, let's see how much we've increased the volume. We've pushed it up to 34.9 ounces, which is right at 1,032 cc's, an increase of 148 cc's overall. 
Well, how about that? Yeah, we are making some progress. No leaps and bounds, but that calculates out to about 16% greater volume, which should mean a little bit more power. Today on Detroit Muscle, we'll peel open the insides of Project Banana Split to give it some cushion. See how a traditional tuck and roll is laid out from guys who know their stitches. We hung the now yellow colored sheet metal back on our 49 Ford last time and bolted on the chrome plated shiny stuff. After giving the wheels some red paint, and retro hubcaps, the exterior of our Project Banana Split is looking far out and fab, man. The interior, it's ready for some serious attention too. Now working with a custom car like we are, this is where you can get real creative because it's a lot like working on a blank canvas. Go to any cool car show and you'll find examples of inspired design where craftsmen have utilized their skill and imagination shaping metal and applying paint to create something unique but you gotta apply the same expertise on the inside to complete the picture. Whether it's a tastefully done T-Bird with handcrafted leather or a lead sled Merc with retro tuck and roll checks. Will Hudson and his father Homer have built high-end cars for many years up in East Tennessee. Whether it's a complete restoration project or just an inside job, they've got the proven passion and talent to turn out great work. We know that because we've had them in our tech center pitching in on special project cars. The results, well, they speak for themselves. So we asked the crew to roll into our Detroit Muscle Shop and apply some of that Hudson's Rod and Custom Magic to our old 49. The white and the yellow together really looks cool. And I think with pulling off a red interior, it's gonna, it's gonna stand out. I really like it and I think this is gonna be a super cool car. The Hudson crew will be taking care of the seats, door panels, carpet, kicks, and package tray. And with anything that requires precise measurements, it all starts with a cardboard template. After it's cut and test fit, it's then transferred over to a mock-up panel, where it's trimmed and test fit again. All right, we've got the panel fitted to the door. We've got the garnish molding fitted to the panel where you're actually gonna take and cut this top line off because the, the panel protrudes out past that. So we wanna remove this piece under the molding. We can do away with it and that will let us start our design and tell us truly what kind of design and what size of space we got for a design. A two inch pleat will match what Will has planned for the seats. So he carefully draws it out, then checks it before moving back to the table. It gets complicated when you have no originals to start with, like our Ford. Templates, mock-up panels, base panels, design panels, covering, not to mention the sewing. A lot of work most custom builders are happy to farm out. A lot of this takes a lot of patience. Some days I, I probably run thin on it, you know, uh, but it's still, it, 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 it's a time-consuming process to do any of this. It just ain't, you know, it looks like it's overnight, but it's not. It, it, it takes time to get what you want. Sometimes you might not get what you want the first time, it might take a second time, but you'll get it. And it's a disappearing tray. We need more younger guys into it, you know, and stuff. Uh, Will himself, he just uh, decided he would like to try it, and so we got a sewing machine, and he self-taught himself, and he just learned from other people. If he had questions, he'd go ask, but uh, young guys anymore, I don't know. It's a shame, because we're having trouble trying to find help right now, you know. We need to get some of them started in that direction they can make a lot of good money for themselves if they really want to apply themselves to it, you know. Here's where I lay out the two inch pleat lines for good right here. We have a piece of sew foam under them and then we start sewing them in. The object is just to keep it straight and keep concentrated. I work every day at it, so try to get better every day, but I've been doing it eight years right now. I was just self-taught. Well, I actually just uh, watched a couple of videos and thought I could do it, and here I am. I'd say if you got the patience, and I'm not sure that I got the patience, but I'm doing it. Continuing in the process, a piece of chipboard is used, again as a template, to help position the pleated piece in the exact location needed. The excess foam is trimmed, and glue is applied to both sides but only at the stitch mark. If 
if we glue the whole works, the whole thing will smash down and we want the pleats to be puffy instead of everything just smash flat. Now the design panel gets quarter inch Landau foam, then trimmed, sanded, and covered with their same red vinyl. On the top here, we're cutting off the excess vinyl. Just gives us less material to work with to wrap all the edges. Behind that is the backing panel, which is what attaches to the door with trim retainers. Once that's down, we'll put the pleats in, line up the chipboard, and tuck all the edges around the base panel, and then it'll be complete. A little steam gets out any wrinkles. Then the panel returns to the door for the final time where it can be secured. I don't want to say it's simple because none of this is simple, but to, to a 50 style, just a pleat interior is a lot different than the stuff that's going on nowadays in the interior work. I mean, the trends right now, it's, it, it's so, this cutting edge, but to go back to do a 50s after you've done, try to do the other stuff, it's, it, it makes it a little easier on you. Up next, our 49 Ford Coupe Project Banana Split gets the rest of its new traditional interior when Detroit Muscle continues. Our Ford's retro red interior is coming to life thanks to the guys at Hudson Rod and Customs. Homer and Mike are laying down a piece of custom carpet we got from rockauto.com. This will pave the way for the rest of our inside job. The first day we brought in this sedan for work, well, our first job, a dirty one, was to tear out 65 plus years of old stock interior. Now, the seats were so nasty, they didn't seem suitable for rat's nest, much less a restoration. Watch out for critters, Joe. <laughs> well, now look at what Will and Mike came up with using the original frame, and I don't believe it. How'd you guys pull this off? Oh, well, when we got them in, they were in bad shape, like you had said. And with it being a split bench, we wanted to do away with that because the mechanisms were so wore, and it's, it gave it like a, a laid-in look. So Mike had come up with putting a bar across the top of it, welding it in, and it actually still works for you to get in the back seat. Oh yeah. So that sure. turned out nice, made, made things easier, and we did away with the ugly of it being in two separate pieces. Well now that it's pretty, I can't wait to see it in the car. Right, I'm ready to check it out. <laughs> Get it? Get it? Glad you made that out of lightweight material. Only the best for you. <laughs> Spare no expense. That's right. I guess I'll do the honors of sitting in it first. I think it shoe fits. Oh yeah. What's up, girl? Yeah, that'd be all right. And this thing feels right nice, I have to say. But I believe we could use an armrest. You think you could fashion something up? I think we can put you something in there. Get that arm propped up for you. A couple of pieces of plywood, some foam, and vinyl, and about 10 minutes of time, bam, instant armrest. The rest of the interior of our 49 Ford comes together equally fast, including a simple package tray, sail panels, and rear side panels. Thanks to Homer and Mike Moore, who helped us solve a problem with our exposed fuse box on the driver's side kick. A clean and elegant solution. Well, it turned out really good. Uh, everything flowed together well. The lines of the interior went together well. It fits the theme, you know, what you guys are trying for. You know, it got a little tuck and roll in it and everything, so it really turned out nice on that. I just think everything we do, stuff like this is cool, you know. Everything don't have to be just the, the always the what's in trend, you know. I think taking something in 50 style just to show that, you know, you got interest in everything that's out there. It's great. We enjoy coming here working. This is not our first time, and we hope you all have us back, and, and we enjoy it every time we're here. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Today on Detroit Muscle, it's one of the most important yet most overlooked pieces of any build. Replacing that scritchy, scratchy old glass with some nice looking new windows. Today we'll show you how the pros cut custom glass to fit and how to install it and make it work. What a pain in the glass!
You know, we've come a long way with our old Ford here since we started the project. But before we can go scooting down the road in that thing, we've got to address an important finishing touch that sometimes gets overlooked. That's right. You spend more time literally looking at the glass of your car than any other part on it. That is because you have to look through it while you're driving down the road. If you just built a nice car, you don't want to be cruising around in it looking through some chipped up, scratched up, nasty windows. It brings the rest of the car down visually. But there's more to it than just throwing glass into a hole, just like there's more to making glass than you might imagine. Even though a form of safety glass was invented in 1903, most car windshields were made of common glass through the early 1900s. On dirt roads, rocks would be kicked up to windshields, which wouldn't crack or chip. Nope, they would shatter into large, dangerous shards. Early versions of laminated glass windshields were made for vehicles by the late 1920s, and the process continued to evolve and improve. In this Ford production film from the mid-30s, a layer of cellulose acetate is used between two layers of glass. Modern laminated glass is created by inserting a vinyl film between the layers of glass. A combination of pressure and heat bonds the film to the glass, so it absorbs energy. In addition to laminated glass, in the 1930s, automakers began to use tempered glass for side and back windows. A heating and rapid cooling process strengthens the glass's outer surface as well as its core. As for our Hot Rod Ford, we'll be using laminated glass all the way around, except here in the rear windshield, which will be heat treated. There's a reason for that, according to our guest expert. All right, here we go. Brian Harding has a company called Glass Guy Chicago. Its motto is Hot Rods to Hollywood because they cut and fit glass for every ride imaginable, including custom cars like our Banana Split. Brian, I want to say thanks for helping out with the project. No problem. Now, oftentimes with the vehicles that we work on in the shop, we can buy replacement glass, and that includes our old Ford back here. But sometimes guys want to do a different route. Why would that be? Well, this old Ford here originally came with laminated glass, so we can do that. Accuracy, if somebody changes something on the car, chops the top, we can get the glass to fit the car that way. And availability, if there's cars out there that you can't get replacement parts for, we can cut it and make it. So you were telling me earlier that a lot of the manufacturers are kind of switching back to the laminated glass. Why is that? Well, it's for safety and it's for sound. It's quieter, and if you're in a side impact, better than being hit with a bunch of little broken pieces of glass. So I guess the idea here is you're going to show us the process, the ins and outs, if you will, of cutting this glass out. Yeah, we're going to start with this original quarter glass. You guys remove the vent window in the quarter, mm -hmm. so this is going to be one continuous piece of glass. So we're going to start with this and we'll continue our pattern down to where the vent window used to be. We'll cut it out of one piece and we'll get it in. Cool. Since it's going to be one piece, the first thing that Brian's going to do is attach the original vent window to allow him to make the template around that shape. This is a lot easier than trying to reproduce the shape on the car itself. This extra relief cut on the bottom will allow it to attach to the hardware that originally held the bottom of the vent window. Once it's cut out, double checking the fitment is always important. That looks good. As with any profession, there are special tools involved in this work. Brian's got several cutters here. Each has a little wheel and they're filled with oil. What's that oil about? The oil in there is for the wheel to continue to roll, makes it so it's an easier cut and glides a little easier. All right, well, I guess you got your favorite and uh, what's your game plan gonna be? Well, I'm gonna lay the template on here and we're gonna kind of look at it and see how many different cuts we're gonna make. Um, we don't usually make an entire cut in an arch like this. It'll be a segment of cuts. As straight a line as possible, makes it a little easier to cut. Okay, I'll get out of your way and let you take your favorite All cut. All right. The first trick that he uses is to cut some triangle-shaped holes into the template. Then through those holes, tape the template down to the glass. A grease pencil or marker will do the work of outlining the window. Then with the template saved to make the passenger side, it's time to grab one of those cutters and get to work. Mm -hmm. 
As the wheel rolls along the surface, it doesn't so much cut through the glass as it cuts a channel into it. This creates a weak point where it can be broken cleanly. To do that, he'll spin it around and put the score mark at the edge of the table. And then, applying gentle pressure finishes the break of the first pane. Now the process has to be repeated on the other side. The idea is to run along the first cut he made. Then once it's broken loose, some heat from a propane torch will make the laminate in the middle more pliable. This lets you bend the glass down far enough to cut the laminate with a razor blade, which frees up the piece we want to get rid of. A little smoothing with a diamond sanding block will get rid of any jagged edges, and that cut is done. Still ahead, it's how to give that freshly cut glass a smooth factory look. And later, it's mounting and reinstalling windows on our Challenger. Stick around. While you were gone, Brian made the rest of the cuts that are going to make up the rough shape of our Ford's quarter window. If you remember, the idea here is to use mostly straight cuts to whittle it down as close to the desired shape as possible. The reason for that is that the glass is much more likely to crack if you start making rounded cuts. Well, that's it for cutting, but uh, we're not done yet, are we? We're far from done. Grinding next? Grinding, we're gonna take our belt sander and various degrees of belts to get uh, the shape and the polish that we want on the edge. Okay, uh, what could go wrong with this kind of deal? If we spend too much time in one area, the glass will get too hot and it could cause it to crack. All right, well, take your time. I'm gonna make sure we don't get uh, glass dust on the Ford. Very good. We'll use our portable downdraft machine to suck up as much of that glass dust as possible. But even still, a mask and some safety glasses aren't a bad idea. This is kind of like bodywork, starting out with 80 grit for the rough work and moving up to a smoother paper as you go. Each time you swap belts, it requires the use of some special glass grinding lubricant that will keep you from heating up the surface too quickly. The first few passes are all about sculpting the shape of the window to meet our needs. Eventually the tool gets smaller as the grit level gets higher to allow for that fine tuning work. Once it's whittled down, a little of Brian's own glass cleaner will get it squeaky for us. You may remember when we did the suicide door conversion that we kind of cut into the front leading edge of the track for the rear window. But that's no big deal, we decided just to make it a fixed window. Now we also went ahead and converted it into a one piece to give it a little custom feel. Now what we're going to use to keep this thing in place is a factory regulator. That way, it's nice and simple. Here you go, Tommy. Thank you, bud. Let's see if this thing goes into place. I think it's hurt. The factory back glass was actually in good enough shape that we could reinstall it onto the car. That'll save us a little change in the long run. As for the windshields, well, Brian went ahead and made us some new ones. We haven't decided yet whether to paint the chrome separator, so we'll leave it for now. The door glass and vent windows are the last ones to go in. We'll use the big piece to locate the other one, and we're good to go. Well, that wasn't nearly as complicated as I thought it was going to be. I guess you could say we're one car down and one Mopar to go. It's really not that hard of a project, as long as you take your time and just take it easy. See this? Well, some cool cats might call it a steering wheel knob, others a suicide knob. Whatever you call it, the idea is to be able to drive with your left hand while you put your right one around your main squeeze. Well, every custom car needs one, and so does our 49 Ford. For some reason, the eight ball's the most common, and well, you can buy ones like this or this ready to attach and drive. But since our Project Banana Split screams yellow, we've got something a little more original. It's a real, slightly used nine ball that 
just happens to match the color of the car. Of course, such creative genius like we came up with comes <laughs> at a price, right? Yeah, that's right. What do we got to do? Well, I guess we got to get this one apart first. Okay, so the first thing is going to be remove this little bitty screw so they can remove that chrome bracket that attaches it to the steering wheel. What I'm trying to save is that little bratted piece in this swivel. Now, I could probably press this thing out or pull it with some little small puller, but I'm scared that I'll end up damaging the piece, so I'm just going to have to cut it with a saw. Now you might not be able to do this so easily if it were a real eight ball, but since it's hollow, it's no big deal to get the insert out of it. With it cut most of the way around, we'll just pry it apart and ta-da! Now as for the nine ball, this is a real pool ball made solid out of plastic. Use a good drill bit like this one we got from KinCut and just take your time with relatively light pressure to drill it out. Then we'll use the arbor press to install the insert. Easy as pie. Well, all right, we've got ourselves a personalized suicide knob. Today on Detroit Muscle, we're gonna get all fired up. It's time for Project Banana Split to menace the streets. How do you get a 49 Ford from this to this? Well, first, with tons of custom metal work, including suicide doors, some handy-dandy door poppers, a recessed license plate, a Frenchton antenna, and a peak hood with lots of louvers. Plus, up front, we transplanted a bumper from an old Chrysler and even customized the headlight vessels. After our special yellow and white banana split paint work, we went total old school with white walls and front hubcaps. Our friends Will and Homer Hudson used their upholstery skills to create a retro red interior for us, complete with rolled and tucked seats. And all that steel is going to be pushed down the road by a fire-breathing flathead V8 built by the guys down at Engine Power. And since you last saw it, we finished the fuel system with a 304 grade stainless steel fuel tank from Rock Valley. This thing is fully baffled, completely TIG welded, and designed to mount up just like the original. Speaking of fire breathing, we've been dying to use this old car to try out a hot rod trick that always gets eye grabbing attention. I mean, anybody can stand out in a crowd of cars with this kind of firepower. Well, today we're gonna get a little wild and turn this Ford into a flamethrower. Tommy's out getting some of the parts we need for this project. Meanwhile, our new team member, Mark Chris, here is already on the case, and you gotta ask, how do we start building a flamethrower? Well, you could start with a flamethrower kit like this one we got from Hot Licks. So at the heart of the kit are these flame control modules, which will send spark through these ignition wires to the spark plugs, which will mount in these bungs in the exhaust system. Using the wire provided, we'll wire it up to this micro switch, which will make it all happen. The kit also comes with a pair of regular old spark plugs, which are pre-gapped to optimize the ignition of the passing fuel. Now, the way that kit works is you take each spark plug and install it in the exhaust eight to 10 inches from the tip. The way it works is you hit the switch inside the car and the 12 volt spark, instead of going to the engine, goes to that module. It pushes unburned fuel through the exhaust. And when it hits this, you got flames. Of course, we have to offer you guys a word of caution. We're talking about sending raw gasoline through your exhaust system and igniting it as it goes out of your tailpipe. You need to make sure that you're not going to do this at your home, in any structure, even near any structure, and certainly not with anyone around. I think you got it covered. Bottom line is, use common sense and you guys got that. Oh, look who finally got here. Well, I've been out scrounging up a few extra items that we're gonna need later down the road, but y'all just gonna have to wait and see what these goodies are for. So the first step is to install the bungs into the tailpipes. We're gonna measure it out, make a mark, and drill our holes. Like we said, anywhere from eight to 10 inches is the sweet spot for mounting those plugs. We'll drill a pilot hole to get things started, then come in with the big boy to make room for that bung. A little filing will clean up the burr. The next thing we're going to do is weld in this nut or the little bung that holds the spark plug. 
Well, I guess I'll go grab the modules. I think I got the wrong end of the stick on this deal. Overhead welding is always fun. Not too much to be said here. Just make sure you seat it well, but don't get it too hot and mess up the threads. Woo wee, I'm there boys. Next, we'll mount the modules. These little things are really cool because they act like a purpose-built coil that fires those spark plugs and makes the cool stuff happen. The kit comes with some self-tappers, but since we're going into the frame, we'll drill and use some machine screws, then run those wires. Well, next we want to use this wire to connect the plug to the module. We've got a spade connector for the module and this blue eyelet for the spark plug. Oh, here's something you might not have known about. The tips of most standard spark plugs are threaded, so this cap can come off. This is the way plug wires were installed in the old, old days, but also works for flamethrowers. How about that? With the plugs installed, we can hook them up to the module. Then with the ground hooked up, splice in the hot wire. After that, we'll run it all the way up to the front and use some loom to make it look nice. We've got our wires ran inside the cab that come from our ignition modules and they're gonna connect right here on this middle post of the switch. Now we've gotta make two more circuit connections that's gonna interrupt our signal that actually lets our engine run. The way this works is that you take the hot wire from your coil and reroute it to the interrupter switch. Then you run another wire from the switch back to the coil. Most of the time this allows the coil to operate normally, but once you press the switch, it redirects the power from the coil back to the exhaust. Voila, flames out the tailpipe. So we'll get our coil hooked up to that switch and then install the switch itself. Well, the moment of truth is upon us. We got the lights turned down low. We got the exhaust fan zone, fire extinguishers everywhere. Safe to say, we're ready to shoot some flames. Well, the old banana's ready to split, so to speak. <laughs> now tell me, Mark, when you started to join us, did you think you'd be driving a 49 Ford on your first payoff drive? I didn't see this coming. You know, maybe GTO or a Corvette. Well, for what it is, it's it's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's certainly not as peppy as that GTO, but yeah. it's cool in its own right, you know? Like they said, it might not run with the pavement pounders of the muscle era, but this yellow machine would have been one bad mama jama during the dawn of the hot rod era. And since it's got a pile of custom mods thrown at it to improve the looks and fun factor, we think that the true old school hot rodders would be proud. She's got all that chrome up front, including a bigger bumper. And don't forget those shiny new headlights and modified bezels. We've got that peaked and louvered hood looking real good, along with these fancy pants white walls and those spinner hubcaps. This French antenna and recessed license plate box make up the rear metal mods, which are offset with our little bitty blue dot taillights. Of course, we kept the vent windows, threw on some skirts, and thanks to Hudson Rod and Custom, we've got a classic tuck and roll interior, along with our caddy steering wheel. But does she drive as good as she looks? Well, there's just something cool about sitting there, looking over all those louvers at the open road. 
definitely doesn't drive like no sports car, but I bet this one's gonna stick out a lot better than some of those sports cars do. Indeed it will. Uh, yeah, you won't see yourself coming down the road. No. Overall, we're gonna call this build a success. Fonzie would probably drive it anyway. And James Dean would too. Well, the old girl runs good, she rides good, stops good. Got a couple of crazy passengers, I'm afraid. She really looks good. The old banana split is finally finished. And you know what? She makes fire. I got marshmallows. Time for a farewell party. That's good. I don't know if I'd eat that.